welcome to Shankar's daily news analysis. Before starting today's discussion, I have an important announcement. Shankar AS Academy is going to conduct a prelims test series known as pre storming which consists of almost 48 tests. You can enroll in this test series. So, added to this, we also have an exclusive current affairs test series. This chakra session consists of almost 50 classes and 8 test series. To know further details about these two test series, you can check the link given below in the description. So, coming to today's topic of discussion, in this first article, we will discuss about the cloud seeding and what are the positive and negative aspects of this cloud seeding. And in the next article, we will discuss the relationship between India and Italy and what is this joint strategic action plan which is signed between both the countries. And in the third article, we will discuss about the India Pacific Ocean Initiative and what is the key pillars and significance of this initiative. And lastly, in this article, we will discuss what is glacial lakes, what is glacial lake outburst flood and how we can mitigate this flood. So, without further delay, let us get into today's discussion. So, take a look at this article which is taken from Indian Express newspaper. We know there is a severe air pollution in the North India, particularly in Delhi and the environmental minister of uh, Delhi who is Gopal Roy is urging the central government to approve the cloud seeding in Delhi. He is also criticizing why there is a delay in addressing the crisis because he is calling this air pollution as a medical emergency because it is going to affect millions of people in the North India specifically. So, what we have to learn from the prelims point of view is what is this cloud seeding? We have, uh, we have to understand what are the substances used, what are the prerequisite required. So, we will be discussing about that in this article. So, what is this cloud seeding? So, this is a scientific process which is used to modify the weather particularly to induce or increase the rainfall in particular region. So, how do they do this? They will disperse certain substances such as silver iodide, potassium iodide and the sodium chloride. So, you have to note these chemicals because this might be a possible prelims question and these substances are dispersed into the air which will encourage the formation of clouds and subsequently lead to the precipitation in the particular region. So, now let us see what are the prerequisite conditions which are required to do this cloud seeding. First is the type of clouds. So, in this image you can see the type of clouds and what type of clouds we need for the cloud seeding is specifically the cumulus clouds or the stratus clouds or the stratus clouds because they have high moisture content which is required for the cloud seeding process. So, these uh, clouds and especially the super cooled clouds will have high liquid which are below the freezing point and this is very really essential for the seeding process. So, now we have seen the type of clouds which are required. Now, talking about the thickness, it should have a minimum thickness of about 4000 to 5000 feet because that will ensure the sufficient water vapor which is required for the precipitation process. Added to that, it is also essential to have a high moisture content which will support the cloud formation. So, take a look at this image. They are talking about the air stability conditions. For the formation of clouds, the, it is required for the formation of clouds, updraft which is nothing but a current of rising air is required which is usually seen in the unstable conditions and this vertical rise of air will help in the sustainable formation of cloud because it will support continuously because it will supply the moisture to the higher altitude continuously which is required for the cloud formation. So, the rising air will support the cloud formation by providing the moisture content. So, how do this cloud seeding work? First process is the injection of chemicals. As already said, they will use chemicals such as potassium iodide, silver iodide and sodium chloride. These are dispersed into the clouds using a generator or using aeroplanes such as in this case. So, the chemicals that we use will act as a condensation nuclei similar to the atoms. So, the atoms will have the nuclei the centers and around that we will have the electrons. Similarly, here this I, uh, nuclei such as the potassium iodide and silver iodide will form the nuclei 
and the water droplets will get attached to that because this chemical will act as surface which for the water vapor to condense and form the drain drops and once the nuclei form the water droplets the water droplets will grow in size until they become heavy enough so that the rain will fall this is the process by which cloud seeding occurs now we will see what are the advantages of this cloud seeding first is the it will as it is evident it will increase the rainfall so if the any region is having drought we can use this to induce the precipitation in case of dry regions and second we have to improve the air quality so how it works is that the rain will wash away the pollutants which are in the atmosphere that will reduce the formation of smog that is in case of that will reduce the smog formation and thereby improve the air quality so that is why they are going to they are planning to implement this cloud seeding technology especially in case of delhi and another advantage is that we know that for agriculture india is a monsoon fed country so we can we are mostly dependent upon the monsoon rain for doing the agriculture if there is a failure of monsoon we are going to struggle so by providing the rain for the crops by using this cloud seeding technology we can face the irregular or insufficient rainfall this is also one of the option that we can consider and next is to boost the water supply so we can use this cloud seeding technology to increase the water availability in reservoirs lakes and rivers to address the water scarcity in the rural as well as urban areas and lastly it can also use to uh, suppress the hail storm and reduce the intensity of hurricanes by altering the cloud dynamics so these are the advantages and possible applications where we can use the cloud seeding now we will see the another aspect that is the negative aspects of this cloud seeding technology first is the weather dependency so this cloud seeding requires the presence of clouds as already seen it is a prerequisite for the cloud seeding it cannot create rain where there is a clear sky so the cloud seeding technology is dependent upon clouds to create the rain and next is the high cost so the process involves significant financial investment in the equipment so we require the chemicals and the air uh, ground generator to apply these chemicals we also require aeroplanes to supply this chemical so it is a uh, high cost inputs are required so it is requiring high amount and expertise to apply this technology and there is also a uncertain effectiveness what they are trying to explain is that the success rate of this cloud seeding is highly variable because the weather patterns are complex and very you also have to understand that there are many environmental concerns surrounding this uh, cloud seeding technology because we are going to use the chemicals which may have uh, long term environmental uh, as well as health effects which is concerning with respect to this cloud seeding process another ethical issue with this residing with respect to this cloud seeding process is that we are going to modify the weather in one particular area this can eventually impact the weather pattern in other areas so this can lead to the conflicts and geopolitical conflicts between different regions so these are the things you have to understand about the cloud seeding technology we saw what is cloud seeding technology what is the prerequisite and what are the positive and negative one thing you have to remember particularly the factual thing is the chemicals which are used now we will see a prelims practice question with respect to this consider the following sodium chloride silver iodide potassium iodide how many of the above substances are used in cloud seeding so we know the answer is all three all these three chemicals are used in the cloud seeding technology with this we'll conclude the discussion on this article and now let's move on to the next one take a look at this article and this article is taken from the hindu newspaper so we know recently our prime minister modi visited nigeria and there happened a initiative called as the sagar manthan the great oceans dialogue so there our prime minister modi highlighted the india's vision for the free open and maritime network there our prime minister modi highlighted the india's vision for the free open maritime network he also mentioned about the indo pacific oceans initiative 
so which is envisioning the marine resources as the key pillar for the growth of nations so in the first paragraph of this article there is also mentioning about the doubling of port capacity so you have to understand that so we have a project called as sagar mala one of the key goal of this uh, sagar mala project is to double the port capacity by the year 2035 this is one of the key goal this is mentioned in the first paragraph of this article so what we have to learn from the prelims perspective is about the indo pacific ocean initiative this is an important initiative we will understand what are the key pillars of it and what is the significance of this initiative from the prelims perspective so let's start the discussion so this uh, indian pacific ocean initiative is a strategic framework which was launched or introduced by india in the year 2019 so where it was introduced is that it is it was introduced in the east asia summit which happened in bangkok so this is the initiative so as you see in the map this is the indo pacific region so here we have the indian ocean and here we have the pacific ocean so these are the countries which are residing in the indo pacific region so this initiative is a non treaty based voluntary arrangement and the main aim is to promote the cooperation for a free and open indo pacific region which is going to be done based on the rules to maintain a regional order in the indo pacific region it is also going to emphasize so this initiative emphasizes a free open and a inclusive indo pacific region and the main focus is on the maritime security on the economic cooperation and sustainable development in the indo pacific region so these are the seven key pillars of the initiative which are mentioned here first is the maritime security so this initiative will ensure a safe and secure maritime borders and freedom of navigation in the indo pacific region and the countries which are enlisted in this slide is that these countries for example in case of maritime security india and uk are the pioneer in this maritime security concept india and uk are the respective leads in this aspect next we have the maritime resources so they encourage a responsible and a sustainable use of the oceanic resources which are present in this region and thirdly we have the marine ecology so this initiative will promote the sustainable practices to protect the biodiversity in the marine region so australia and thailand are the lead countries with respect to the maritime ecology and the france and indonesia are lead countries with respect to the resources in the region so the other pillars are namely the capacity building and resource sharing this will strengthen the maritime capacity among the nations and next we have the disaster risk reduction so by enhancing the preparedness for the disaster and by increasing the resilience we can face the disaster efficiently and the other pillars are science and technology and cooperation in the academics and lastly we have the trade connectivity and the maritime transport so germany is the lead in case of capacity sharing and in case of capacity building and resource sharing and india and bangladesh are best with respect to disaster reduction and management and italy and singapore are the lead in case of science and tech and academic cooperation and in case of trade connectivity us is the lead so now we will see what are the significance of this initiative specifically so first significance is to broaden the indo pacific narrative what they are trying to convey is that this initiative will expand the focus from the traditional security in issues and they will diversify their focus be it in case of the economic growth development and the environmental challenges in this specific area and next we have the focus to improve the collaboration between the countries so this initiative mainly focuses on bringing the regional countries together so that they will be aligned together to meet a shared goals such as uh, maritime security or in case of sustainable development for example we have the asian outlook so asian is focusing on the free open and indo pacific region and this is complementing with the indo pacific ocean initiative so the regional countries will collaborate together to align their efforts to the shared goals and next we have the focus 
or the significance to address the threats which are present in this region. So, this initiative will help to counter the challenges such as the increase in dominance of China in the Southeast and East Asian countries. For example, in the year 2020, India as well as Vietnam agreed together to strengthen their cooperation under this initiative. As already said, one of the basic focus of this initiative is to ensure the maritime security. So, it will promote the peace and stability in this Indo-Pacific region with the help of joint efforts and the partnership. They also support collaboration to secure a critical minerals such as lithium, cobalt as well as rare earth materials which are essential in case of technology and industries. Another special feature about this initiative is that it is flexible in nature. So, it is going to offer a non-institutional adaptable platform. So, this will be helpful to meet the challenges which are emerging in nature in the. So, it is going to offer an adaptable platform which will be making it responsible to the emerging challenges in the Indo-Pacific region. So, in this article discussion, we saw what is this Indo-Pacific Ocean Initiative, what are the significance and key pillars of it and what countries are lead in each pillars. So, take a look at this article which is taken from the Hindu newspaper. The crux of this article is that there was a glacial lake outburst flood in case of Tista Valley and it has caused devastating impact in the Tista Valley be it in case of the infrastructure and it has also caused a loss of life. So, we have to take mitigative measures to deal with this glacial lake outburst flood. What we have to learn from this article is that we have to learn about the basics of GLOF which is the glacial lake outburst flood and we have to also learn what are the mitigative measures which can be taken to deal with this. So, let us start the discussion. So, before understanding about the glacial lake outburst flood, we have to know about what are these glacial lakes. So, glacial lakes are nothing but these are water bodies which are formed by the melting of glaciers, especially in case of the mountainous region. And another term we have to understand is about the moraines. Moraines are nothing but these are accumulation of debris such as rocks, sand and even gravel. So, whenever a glacier moves, there is an accumulation of this debris that a glacier deposits along its edges and these are called as moraines. So, when the glacier retreats, it may leave behind a moraine that is this debris and this will block the natural flow of a river or stream and it will create a dam such as in this image called as the moraine dam and this will lead to the formation of glacial lake behind the moraine. This is called as the glacial lake. Now, we will see how these glacial lakes are formed. Firstly, the glaciers will erode the land beneath them and they will create depressions. So, as this glacier retreats, these depression fill with the melted water and this will eventually form the lake. So, there are many types of glacial lake. For example, we have the pro-glacial lake which is shown in this first image. So, these are found at the front of retreating glaciers. So, these lakes are created when a glacier advances and they will block the flow of river or stream with this moraines. As the glacier melts, the water from the melt water will collect behind the moraine and this will form the lake. This is called as the pro-glacial lake. And the next type of glacial lake is the cirque lake. So, these lakes are formed like a bowl shaped depression which are carved by the glaciers. We also have another type called as the subglacial lakes and these are found beneath the glaciers or the ice sheet. So, there are many examples. For example, we have the Cholamu lake which is located in the state of Sikkim. We also have the Pangong lake which is partially glacier and it is located in Ladakh. And lastly, we have the Rupkan lake which is located at Uttarkhand. So, having understood about the glacial lake, now let us see what is glacial lake outburst flood. So, it is nothing but it is a sudden release of water from a glacial lake which is caused by the breach of a natural moraine or a ice dam. So, what are the causes of this bluff? First is the ice or rock avalanches 
or uh, landslide into the lake we also have earthquakes which can cause the glacial lake outburst flood and lastly the melting of glaciers because of the climate change can also cause the glacial lake outburst flood so what are the typical characteristics of this glacial lake outburst flood first is the sudden onset it will be sudden uh, in nature and next it is going to have a high velocity and a high volume of water and lastly it will have a high destructive potential these are the typical characteristics of the glacial lake outburst flood now we will see how this can be dealed so first we will divide into two cases one is the structural mitigative measures and the non structural mitigative measures first let's discuss about the structural mitigative measures so the structural mitigative measures are nothing but we are going to use engineering based solutions to prevent the disasters or to reduce this impact for example we have the building of dams or flood diversion channels and to strengthen the moraine dams and we can also install the drainage systems in the glacial lakes these are called as the structural measures now let's see one by one first we have the lake drainage so they will artificially lower the water levels with the help of tunnels and next we have the moraine dam enforcement so they will strengthen the natural barriers in this case and third we have the flood diversion channels which will divert the flood waters to the safer areas comparatively and fourthly we have the retention basins which will temporarily store the excess flood waters and lastly we can also install sensors to track the water levels and the stability of the dam so this is also one of the structural mitigative measures so now we will see what are the non structural mitigative measures so this is nothing but we are going to use policy and awareness to reduce the disaster risk firstly we have the early warning system so what we can do in this early warning system is that we can do the real time monitoring with the help of satellite imagery gis and remote sensing so by using this early warning system we can alert the vulnerable communities who are going to be impacted because of this glacial lake outburst flood and next we can risk zoning and mapping so what we can do under this is we are going to identify and map the hazardous zones which are having high risk we can also implement land use planning to prevent the settlements who are residing in this vulnerable zones and other non structural mitigative measures include the community preparedness so we can conduct awareness campaigns on the glaf risk we can give training to the vulnerable community to increase the efficiency of the disaster response we can also do the policy integration so what we can do is that we can promote the climate resilient infrastructure and integrate the glaf risk management into the development planning and lastly afforestation can also be done to stabilize these slopes as they are prone to landslide which can cause the glacial lake outburst flood so these are the non structural measures which we can do to deal with the glacial lake outburst to deal with the glaf so in this discussion we saw what is glacial lakes what are the types of glacial lakes we also saw what is glaf and what can be done that is the mitigative measures to deal with this glaf so with this knowledge let's see a prelims practice question which of the following are the causes of the glaf one landslide two melting of glaciers three tectonic activity and four rising sea levels so the answer will be 1 2 and 3 because landslide can cause glaf melting of glacier can also cause glaf the tectonic activity that is the earthquake can also cause glaf so rising sea levels cannot lead to the formation of glacial lake outburst flood so this is not the answer so the correct answer will be c 1 2 and 3 with this we'll conclude the discussion on this article and now let's move on to the next one take a look at this article which is taken from indian express newspaper so our prime minister modi and the italian prime minister giorgia meloni has announced a plan joint strategic action plan with so this is a five year strategic plan so they announced this plans during their meeting on the sidelines of the g20 meeting which happened in brazil so the main aim of this 
joint strategic action plan is to strengthen the bilateral collaboration between these two countries, especially on the key areas such as defense, trade, energy, space, culture and education. So, we have to understand what is the key relationship between these two countries and we will also discuss what are the provisions and focus area of this plan detail. Let us start the discussion with the understanding about the relationship between India and Italy. First, let us start with the political relationship. It was established since independence and almost 15 MOU has been signed between both the countries covering various areas such as energy, media, finance and the shipbuilding. And talking about the economic relationship, Italy is one of the India's top 5 trading partner in the European Union and Italy ranked 18th in the FDA inflow to India between, so they have considered the year 2000 to 2020 for this uh, calculation and they have contributed almost 3.02 billion dollars in the FDI inflows. And the bilateral trade between both these countries has reached 5 billion euros in 2022 and which has been doubled from comparison to the year 2020. Talking about the defense cooperation between both the countries. So, there was a naval exercise between both the countries called as Milan and this naval exercise happened between Italy and India. We also had a, a naval exercise conducted by the INS Tabar along with the Italian Navy in the Tyrrhenian Sea. So, let us see this map. So, here we have the Italy. So, here is the Tyrrhenian Sea. We also, so the other water bodies surrounding Italy are the Ligurian Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, the Ionian Sea and the Adriatic Sea. So, this can be a possible prelims question on which of the following water bodies are surrounding the Italy. So, you can have a look at this map and you can also see Sicily is a island of Italy and we also have Sardina which is a island of Italy. Also, we have a military cooperation group between both the countries called as the called short form as the MSCG and it was established to strengthen the defense ties between both the countries. Talking about the cultural exchange, an agreement for the cultural cooperation between both the countries was signed in the year 1976 and almost 10 Italian university offer courses on the Indian art, history and languages. And in case of science and technology, an agreement was signed between both the countries for the cooperation since the year 1978 and there was a program called as ITPAR which is nothing but the India Trento program for the advanced research and this is a key initiative under the science and tech cooperation under this agreement. So, the Indian community in the Italy is almost 2.5 lakh and it is the third largest in Europe. So, first being UK and second being Netherlands and third is the Italy. So, we have the population of almost 2.5 lakhs. It is the fifth largest foreign community in case of the Italy. So, these are the basics thing. So, these are some basics you have to understand with respect to the Italy and India relationship. Now, we will see what are the key focus area of the uh, joint strategic action plan between both the countries. First, we have the defense. So, annual joint defense consultative meetings and joint staffs talk to facilitate the exchange of information visit between both the countries. This is planning to strengthen the defense tie between both the countries. So, by strengthening the interaction, we are planning to align with the Italy's growing interest, especially in case of the Indo-Pacific region to enhance the cooperation between both the countries. Talking about the economic cooperation, so this plan is encouraging industrial partnership between both the countries to establish technology technological centers and to promote the mutual investment in case of automobiles, semiconductors, infrastructure and to even advance the manufacturing sectors. And we have to talk about the connectivity as well to enhance the maritime as well as land infrastructure collaboration particularly within the India, Middle East and Europe economic corridor. 
So, this framework is also planned under this joint strategic action plan. So, so they are also planning to improve the cooperation in the emerging technology such as telecom, artificial intelligence and in case of the digitalization of the services. So, with respect to space, ISRO and the Italian Space Agency are planning to sign collaborative projects in the earth observation space exploration and especially by focusing on the lunar science. And in case of energy transition, they are also planning to collaborate under global initiatives such as the Global Biofuel Alliance and the International Solar Alliance to improve the usage of the renewable energy. And lastly, talking about the migration and mobility, they are planning to facilitate the legal migration between both the countries with the help of transparent labor training and recruitment procedures. So, how they are going to do is that they are going to launch a pilot program to train the Indian healthcare professionals to support the employment of Indian individuals in Italy. So, in this article discussion, we saw what are the focus area of this joint strategic action plan which is signed between India and Italy. And we also saw what are the basics of this relationship. So, with this, we will conclude the discussion. And now, let us see a prelims practice question. Which initiative is a part of India-Italy science and technology cooperation? So, the answer will be B, India Trento program for the advanced research. With this, we will conclude discussion on this article. We have come to end of today's video. If you found the video informative, do hit like, give your feedback, says comment and do not forget to subscribe. Thank you. Have a nice day.